I'm Jeff Shaw, and this is uh, In the Studio, produced by Davis Media Access and airing on dctv.davismedia.org and local cable channel 15, as well as AT&T Uverse channel 99. Uh, today, I'm joined by Joanne Shook. Joanne Shook has been a resident of Humboldt County since 1989, where she's worked as a custom woodworker, designer, and community activist. Joanne is the co-producer of Tricky Business. This uh, DVD I'm holding up right now in film. Uh, Tricky Business is a home is about the is it takes place in the hometown of Arcata, California. It's a look at the complexities of marijuana culturally, legally, and personally from the people who have lived with it in their community for over 40 years. So I'd like to roll the trailer for that, and then we'll talk with Joanne in a minute. There is a lot of money involved in marijuana. Twilight, I'd see helicopters flying with these huge loads of marijuana hanging from the helicopters. It is interesting that we found out that people next door were uh, running their grow house because we always wondered why they were so unfriendly. I would sit in the backyard with a pair of binoculars and I could watch what they're doing. <coughs> I'd call the cops like, he's got his truck loaded with marijuana, get him. I had an electrician come over to my house and he said, you know, you could be making $40,000 a year out of that back room. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, they're all growing a little bit of pot. Your grandmother's growing it. So, uh, first off, Joanne, you said that this is on your website, notice it says you're a first time documentary maker and I was, I've, I've seen the movie, uh, the entire film, and I was thinking that's pretty impressive for the first time. Thank you. Uh, you're airing in um, film festivals, 10 different film festivals mentioned from Aberdeen to Nevada City, the Wild and Scenic, Scenic and Film Festival. Are you sure this is your first documentary? <laughs> um, it I, is. <laughs> so what kind of, did you have production experience before you got into making this? Or? Well, this all started back in 2009, and um, actually I've been interested in film ever since college and okay. back in the day uh, making a movie was so expensive and the yeah. cost of film I took one film class back then and and realized uh, I, two things were against me working with film back then one it cost so much and the other is you had to work cooperatively with people right yeah. and I was an art major and I was much happier just going off on my own and doing my own projects it's and definitely a media person myself it is a team project right. a team experience right. so yeah it's a team I was, uh, you mentioned the catalyst for going into this, but before we even talk about that, so any, what, any other production experience you had other than college with the, with the newfangled equipment that we have these well, days? Well, once we got the idea to make the movie, I um, actually went and, and went to our own um, Humboldt Access yes. public uh, TV. Access Humboldt up there, uh, yes. Right, Access Humboldt. We all Humboldt. have different names there. All, we take the same words, but then, then you move it back and forth. Them, yes. um, and uh, took some classes there and learned a little bit about okay. using the camera. Very cool. Um, and they were using a similar camera to what I had, which was the uh, HV30 Canon. Okay. And um, so it, it was a kind of small, inexpensive camera that could film uh, at uh, 20, right. uh, 24p. And sure. it also allowed you to jack in mics so we could get good quality sound. So this is all, this is your first documentary. Right. And the catalyst for you, so, and you, you had the idea first, and then you went and learned how to use all the equipment, basically. It, yeah, you know, Other I, than you had, you had some structural storytelling uh, experience from college. Or, very, very little. And uh -huh. I think my background as a furniture maker actually played into it more uh -huh, than cool. anything that happened in college, because it's very similar to making furniture, is you have... You kind of have a vision of what you want to make. You work with little tiny pieces over a long period of time. Right. And then you eventually get to put them all together. So yeah. organizationally speaking, uh, a big part of making a documentary like this was figuring out, OK, how do we get all these disparate yeah. pieces together? And also, how do you find talent to help you? And we found a great editor, uh, Diana J. Brody out of San okay. Francisco. So she, you know, she's a wonderful professional uh, editor. But we, we put the movie together in pieces, and then we did the rough editing, uh, my, my film partner and I, um, Lynn Canning, mm -hmm. and then gave it to Diana to save, you know, save money. Yes. We did most of the work on that end of it, and then she did the, the, the final and finishing work. So it, took, it did take a team, as you mentioned, but it, I love that you came to it from a much different angle than a lot of people come to it, which is uh, they want to be filmmakers, and uh, you came to it and that you first sort of identified an issue that right. uh, you uh, 
personally experienced in Humboldt, and why don't you explain? You you mentioned it that you're, the issue that you was a catalyst is this um, home uh, growing operation. So why don't you explain uh, explain some of that? For yeah, me? well, and it, it was it was kind of like um, living in Humboldt County. I've been up there for 25, 30 years, and there you know there had always been marijuana in the area, but mostly it was up in the hills. Mm -hmm. And um, I happened to be uh, taking care of my mom and dad who were aged and so I was home a lot with them. My mom had dementia uh -huh. so I couldn't leave her alone a lot. So being around the house a lot in Arcata, looking out the window of my cul-de-sac, I, I slowly realized that three out of the four houses on the cul-de-sac were involved in marijuana business in some way mm -hmm. and we were the fourth house. So I'm like this is really different than what has been traditionally we are marijuana growing area but it had never been in the houses like it was then. Right. So this is 2009, and I called up my friend Lynn, who had gone to s school with me, college, mm -hmm. and we had actually had a film class together, uh, film criticism, and I said, there's a documentary happening here. We've, we've got to do something. There's something historically different happening, and I want to understand it. Right, so uh, that sort of was the catalyst and started your exploration. Yeah. And um, I... We're going to talk a little bit about the issues of the film and also the film itself because, uh, I th like as I mentioned to you, uh, I think you guys did a great job of sort of weaving uh, the background of the marijuana e economy up there with the current issues that are faced with it being such a big economy. So um, can you tell me, I mean, how big an economy is the marijuana industry uh, in California and you know, how much money is it worth uh, well, in, overall? You know, Humboldt County is part of the Emerald Triangle, which includes Mendocino and Trinity counties. In Humboldt County, it is, it is conservatively estimated that it's about uh, $5 billion. Right. Um, we had a local banker do a study recently where um, she kind of tracked as much money as she could and then conservatively said, this is what I think is, is the amount of money flowing. Right. Um, so, so there's a lot of motivation for people to uh, to be growing either what I guess a, a good crop or a lot of, of uh, crop. I mean, the you mentioned in your movie also that the price point um, of three thousand dollars for a pound of marijuana. And that was two thousand nine. Now, now the price point is like for a pound of marijuana, it's about uh, twelve hundred dollars now. Okay, so the price Ballpark. fluctuates. Yes. And do you like any commodity like corn? <laughs> so uh, the inspiration for these grow houses being uh, either flourishing or sort of more of them, does that fluctuate with the price also do you, did you find? Or was um, it sort of just all of a sudden there's all these houses that are sort of becoming grow houses? Or Well, the history went from um, the initial grows that were in Southern Humboldt back in the early uh, 70s, late 60s. Back then, it was $5,000 a pound. Mm -hmm. So I personally knew people who grew maybe five plants and harvested them and that would allow them to build an, you know, an addition on their house or to buy a new refrigerator. Or, right. you know, it, was, it was part of them living on the land and being able to develop the land and live independently. And once people sort of figured out, wow, this is a really lucrative crop, even in Southern Humboldt, it started to become you know, a difference between people who were growing a little bit to survive to people who said, wow, we can make a lot of money from this. Right. So back, that was you know, way back, and as yeah. As people became more aware of the outdoor grows in Southern Humboldt and there became a police presence, yes. um, we had a thing that is still in operation now called camp where you know you, you drive through Southern Humboldt in this, in, during harvest season and there'd be helicopters flying back and forth and there'd be bus and there'd be smoke, mm -hmm. the other kind of smoke, where they'd be growing, you know, pull out plants and burn them. Sure. Um, and, and that sort of forced the growers indoors. So, I see. So at that point in time, they were also doing a thing where um, if you were caught with any marijuana on your property, even if you didn't plant it, um, the government could take away uh, your house. Okay. So um, as you know, we have the California laws around marijuana, and then the federal law is completely different. Federally, marijuana is a, a Schedule One felony drug, so it's the highest penalties, the highest enforcement. Right. And you know, a, a drug with no municipal, no medicinal value is right. is the uh, idea, Where, and that's in conflict, direct conflict with what's happening in California. So it wasn't necessarily the price that drove uh, the growth of these grow houses or indoor farms, kind of as you as you talk about them in the film. It was more the fact that the enforcement became so uh, right. draconian and sort of militaristic, and that 
people were really were getting their houses uh, or getting their land seized, seized yeah. and everything. That's really the impetus as to what drove this uh, people into these uh, into rented homes. A lot of cases. And and you know it's kind of like you know if you have a force of water, it wants to go somewhere, and the force of water is people's desire to have marijuana. Mm -hmm. So once they blocked it from you know outdoor grows, people started to think, well, let's grow it indoors. And there were some funny stories in the early days. People would bring outdoor plants into houses. Right. And outdoor plants are, you know, can be 10 feet tall. So they found one house in Arcata where the growers had cut the floor out of the plant, uh, out of the, out of the, uh, house, the house, and put the plants down on the subfloor right. so that these gigantic plants could grow. Yeah. Um, well, now let's get into some of the meat of your uh, of your movie, Tricky Business. I'll hold up the DVD one more time. Um, <laughs> the, the deal with the, the, these grow houses, uh, I think I th you spend a, quite some time in the movie talking about some of the problems these grow houses present to your community and to the residential areas. And um, some of the I was surprised uh, at some of the problems that you highlighted in your movie. And I, I, ha I made a list of some of them. I'm sure you can talk a little bit more about them. But, you know, PG&E transformers blowing up mm -hmm. um, due to overloaded power usage, um, electric bills of three to four thousand dollars a month. I mean, this is just for small little rental areas. Uh, major house modifications. So to do these uh, indoor farms, you'd have to um, new duct work and everything to try to sort of uh, aerate the plants and keep everything from getting too moldy. Wet floors, holes for the new electric work. Mm -hmm. These are in rental houses. Mm -hmm. uh, Break-ins and robberies of grow houses and then sort of spreading to non-grow houses where regular right. residents you know, were mistakenly broken into. Um, fires, firemen on your film mentioned 50% uh, of house fires were associated with grow houses. At one in, time, yeah. At one time. Yeah. Um, and then of course the major building code violations. Um, one of them that I thought you highlighted pretty well was the firemen, firewomen, um, ha having a situation where they're turning off the breaker in order to go into a burning house and the power is not going out because right. uh, people are installing these pretty intricate, intricate but still not up to code uh, electrical systems that bypass uh, the power meter, bypass the right. breaker. So uh, firemen are going to, would be going into burning homes, wires from all the you know crazy electric work that's been done, and uh, their lives could be endangered by being electrocuted right. by uh, exposed wires. Uh, so. The, you know, it just it was amazing. High levels of but butane and propane also on site that could explode. So, you know, real hazard if you're in your neighborhood and your house right next door yeah. has got this huge propane tank. You know, you're not living in a rural area. This is a residential area. Mm -hmm. And when that thing explodes, <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, yeah. all these problems you right. highlighted were just like, wow, this is. It's kind of, it blows people away. And, you know, I had friends, when I said I was making this documentary, I said, well, what's the big deal? It's just a little pot. It's like, it's way more complicated than that. And I think the film is current because we've got legislation coming up in the next year about mm -hmm. how do we legalize marijuana. And, you know, I think that issues brought up by the film really highlight what people should be thinking about when they think about changing the law. Yes. Um, and, you know, the... Right. Uh, for instance, uh, you mentioned the only way to prosecute some of the operations is through uh, money laundering activities. And right. so the police don't really have their own tools. And I guess we should be kind of careful talking uh, about the problems because uh, the, the source of the problems we can go back to is sort of uh, the fact that it's at the federal level, you know, there's not much guidance. There, lo local municipalities don't have many tools. But oh, why is it that it's a uh, the, the police have to go through it as a laundering activity? Because you had some neighbors in your film complaining directly to the police, saying, "This is a huge grow operation. These mm -hmm. guys are loading up the marijuana now. Mm -hmm. um, nothing they can well, do." Well, we've we've always been a very accepting area to marijuana, and people do appreciate medical marijuana. Uh, in the area, you know, I think, and, and you kind of kind of find that uh, is not unusual. That it's like uh, someone who's even a conservative person will say, "My wife was helped by being able to uh, smoke marijuana yeah. when she had cancer. It was the only thing that we got her to eat." And so, in Humboldt County, it was hard to find a, a jury pool that would put someone in jail for having a marijuana grow because mm -hmm. it's like, "Hey, it's part of the lifestyle up. It's yeah. part of what people, and it and it supports a lot of the businesses and people are." keenly aware of that. But when people have a lot of guns in a grow or they have a lot of cash where it's obvious that it's gone beyond the level of 
you know, it's, it, we, uh, we call them greed growers. Mm -hmm. um, then, then people are like, oh, yeah, we don't necessarily want to have that in the neighborhood. Well, um, I'm glad you brought up that it does bring a lot of money to the area. Right. Um, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, you mentioned in the, the community clinic, community center in the Redwood Garberville area, that uh, Matoll community center. In I the think, early days, yeah. In the early yeah. days, uh, a lot of money that was circulating in this community uh, helped build infrastructure that may not otherwise be built that uh, mm -hmm. clearly served a pretty good uh, civic purpose and that um, that you know that, i mean that even with these operations that are have a criminal element to them i mm -hmm. guess you'd say a good the greed growers there's still a lot of cash moving around to legitimate businesses you mentioned the bank one third of their money was mm -hmm. uh, was all right um so there are legitimate businesses that are i mean if you go to uh Crescent City or somewhere farther north, they're, they're in maybe worse economic, there's less cash moving through the, moving through the local economy in some cases. Well, I had a friend or? come to town and, and you looked around and said, you know, all your stores are all painted nice, you yeah. know, everything is trimmed, you know, things are looking good here. Um, and, you know, the, the problem with the, where the money used to be uh, $3,000 a pound when I started filming in 2009, it's, it's gone down. People are still want to make as much money as they used to, so they've increased the size of their grows, which has changed the relationship. It, you know, back in the day when people were selling at $5,000 a pound, they only needed to know one person to distribute the pot. Okay. Now, because they're growing much more amounts, yeah. it's going to a middleman. It's you know, it's becoming a different kind of business there. Right. So even though we have you know a level of financial support in the town and and Arcata um, is kind of you know it's it's the business of the town in a lot of ways. Though it's not the only thing we do. I mean, Arcata's got a lot of talent, and we're we're a phenomenal area for or all kinds of businesses. I want to be clear about that. Yeah. Um, but you know this. Uh, you can definitely see the a lot of the energy from the town comes from this business. Yeah, I, I, you, to go on that a little bit, um, you did mention in your film that Arcata has one of the largest uh, source of oysters for, um, right. Arcata Bay has a yes. large source of oysters for, uh, for yeah. California or for the nation, I think. Uh, California so. and Humboldt Fog Cheese and, you yeah. know, Coca Tat was, you know, like a sporting goods and Yakima products, you know, anybody who's got a rack on their car knows oh. what a Yakima is. Um, well, so I grew up in Nevada City, actually, which you're, where you're ah, filming me going cool. to. And, um, one of the things that is current an issue up there, we talked about grow houses in your film in Arcata. Um, you know, there's a lot of Forest Service land surrounding mm -hmm. Nevada City. And so some of the grow operations up there uh, end up leaving all kinds, you know, get the local streams are polluted by high f influx of nitrogen and uh, left over by, uh, you know, plastic pipes running miles to, get, uh, to keep the water flowing into some of the grow operations, uh, weapons, as you mentioned, and then people camping out and just leaving all their stuff. And so, you know, the problem, uh, the problem is not just grow houses in some communities, uh, you know, where, especially California, that um, the, the, you know, the money flows in the community hands, but the, the community kind of has to deal with some of the problems on, on that. And, you know, I think, you know, the growers who gave money back to the community, people appreciated that that was like, okay, we're, we're kind of a place that makes it possible for you to grow and you're paying back in. So there was more of a feeling like this is all, this is good for the community. But when people come and, you know, wreck the place yeah. and then just take the money out and go somewhere else or, you know, with the streams, uh, in Humboldt County, there's been you know, some streams have been drained dry, and some of the rivers have you know, stopped flowing. Yeah. And uh, diesel spills from the diesel generators, and then of course the poison that's used to keep animals from eating the plants right. has killed off um, uh, some endangered species. The fisher was, you know, is a is a population that's. Uh, threatened by the poisons up yeah, there. Yeah, um, it's a real problem <laughs> that I don't think a lot of people are talking about, which makes your film so great. Yeah. Um, let me get to getting back to your film. Uh, I like that in the final part of your film, you sort of focus on some of the pro uh, solutions to some of these problems and some of the creative ways that Arcata has gone about. Right. Uh, because some of the creative ways Arcata has gone about to try to solve these problems. One of them was a zoning restriction on the use of over on the use of power, sort of uh, trying to limit how much power a resident could possibly use, and I thought that was a creative way. Uh, maybe because you know, it. if you're in a residential area, the electrical lines are set up for a certain amount of usage, and we've seen it when there's like brownouts and stuff. They don't want you to, you know, run. Uh, 
uh, your dishwashers during that time. Yeah. So a, a single house that is a grow house with maybe 20,000 watt lights in it is using like 600% of the electricity of a normal house. 600% uh -huh. times, you know, the yeah. electricity. And the... Uh, Let alone the environmental footprint. Well, but that's, yeah. yeah. And, okay. and Arcata has always been a very green city. We yeah. had the first green city council that was ever voted in. And we're always very conscious of that. Sure. And so it was such an embarrassment to realize that this huge... And PG&E was perfectly happy because, you know, yeah. we were using so much electricity. They're installing new infrastructure. Yeah, they were very inside. happy, you know, with that. So, you, so you, a zoning ordinance passed the restricted, uh, try to set a limit on how much power or how yeah, did that yeah. work? Yeah, if you're using um, a certain amount past, I think it's 400% past normal house, then they can tax you on that use. I see. So it sort of red flags a house as being a grow house. And, and I was concerned because I had a friend who was a potter who worked with an electric kiln. And I go, what's well, this going to affect my friend? It turns out that even running an electric kiln several times a week is not at any way near what a grow house generates. So, it's so, so she's not even touched by it. So the power consumption is so far beyond the right. normal use of a residential well, unit. Well, and, and you know, the houses, the ones that have are fully uh, changed into industrial grows have so much humidity and electricity. There's one house in the film where I show, you know, that the, the, the clapboard panels outside are actually oozing moisture. Uh -huh. So you, you know, now when you walk through Arcata because they passed the excessive uh, electrical use tax, whereas you used to be able to smell pot, you know, or cannabis on every street, now it's, it's very rare to smell it. And, um, wow. and it's actually, you know, the growers have moved out of Arcata into other areas. That sounds so. like a part two for your, for your film. Yeah, uh, trickier business or yeah. tricky business two or the return of tricky business, son of tricky business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what's interesting to me is that um, sort of not by confronting marijuana prohibition at the federal level, uh, these localities like Arcade are sort of left to na negotiate this terrain by yeah. themselves. And uh, you have an attorney mentioned in your film uh, that if marijuana was taken off Schedule One controlled substances, which is the highest level for, um, for controlled substances, it would allow for all kinds of regulatory tools to be used mm -hmm. uh, to control the negative aspects in which we've kind of been talking about. Um, so we have these local ordinances that are kind of viewed as, to me, they seem like kind of workarounds to sort of mm -hmm. like deal with the right. impacts before other regulatory tools can be used to kind of control. And I appreciate sort of the, uh, the spirit of Arcata, which is like, well, you know, not too much regulation, mm -hmm. but certainly something has to, has to be done. So these, it kind of seems like, uh, you know, municipalities are kind of have their hands tied behind their back to some extent. Well, and you, they also are concerned with having places that are growing marijuana in a clean way. You know, if, if someone is actually using it for medication, yeah. then, you know, you don't necessarily want to have um, cannabis that's been grown with a lot of chemicals or been sprayed right. for, uh, uh, for gnats uh, sure. that come on there. So the, uh, Arcata was really conscious that this was um, this, a state approved medical use. Yeah. and that people had a right to grow. And they did come up with a um, regulation now that in your own house, you can be, have a, a five by 10 canopy and two lights. Uh -huh. So for personal use, that's what they consider a, you know, a, adequate personal use. But you can't turn a whole house into a marijuana grow right. at this point. Um, yeah, I think the issues that are brought up in your film and brought up in general by this, uh, this topic are just sort of on the forefront of, um, I mean, I, I, in some sense, it feels like we've been here before, and you mentioned this in your film with alcohol prohibition in right. the 20s, and it seems like there is kind of a model for slowly bringing things into normalcy mm -hmm. rather than on the fringes. Um, but in another way, this actually seems like a pretty new issue because uh, of the medical side of it. You know, alcohol, I don't think was ever seen as a actually, medical. Actually, during prohibition, um, in order to drink alcohol, you could get a note from your physician, oh. and it was called uh, uh, medical alcohol. Uh -huh. And um, I, I'm come from Chicago, and Walgreens, which is a big uh, drugstore there. Sure. Walgreens started out with a couple of drugstores in Prohibition, and by the time Prohibition was over, they had like 50, because uh -huh. they basically were able to expand their business because they were a drugstore that would sell you alcohol. Right. So yes, we have been here before. I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the other thing you mentioned before we went on the air is just how uh, there's some parallels to you know Napa Valley and the wine yeah. um, community there. Uh, of course, it's wine. <laughs> they came into being much a lot further after Prohibition. 
but we might reach a point uh, if marijuana becomes legal that Humboldt becomes, you know, has some sort of microeconomy uh, with uh, specializing in. Uh, we have marijuana. amazing growers, and you know, there's there's a real um, split thinking in Arcata because there's a lot of pride with the quality of what people can produce and how much science goes into it, and sure. and how I mean, the industry is very clever. I mean, when when we had the uh, spate of fires, the uh, grow house dis um, supply stores actually came out with fire protection. Uh, devices so that you know um, grow houses you know fires dropped right away right you know like they address the problems they're they are hard-working people yeah and, sure. and you know um, Arcata what is it Willie Nelson says he gets his his pot his cannabis from from, Ar from well, Arcata he, he's so. the first uh, celebrity endorsement I guess <laughs> yeah although he's there's actually there's probably many celebrity endorsements and, and you know the work with uh, <laughs> hybridization so, you know, once they started working with different plants and different strains, using it for different things medically, and, and now it's all trial and error and individuals, yeah. you know, there's no way to do medical testing because the federal government actually has put um, uh, restrictions on medical testing, which was, it wasn't in the film, we didn't get to this, but, yeah. but it's one of those things that, like they say, there's no medical use for this, but then they won't let you test it to find out if there is. Sure. And other places like Canada and Israel, all have come up with, you know, medical, um, actual patented mes medicines for it. Well, I mean, this topic you can go really deep with. It's really deep. And uh, I appreciate that you, uh, in your film, that you uh, did explore some of the background, and I, um, I encourage people to check that out if they're interested in this topic. Uh, I also appreciate the tone you take on this film. Uh, you know, it's the whole the whole uh, tone that people have around marijuana, you know, stoners, et cetera, et cetera, and yeah. ha-ha, it's hilarious and everything. Uh, I think it's I think it's good to have a sense of humor, but I also think it's I appreciate the tone and the sort of the serious tone that you took in this movie, mm -hmm. um, having lived the experience up in Arcata, and I think that a lot more people are going to be living some of these experiences that Arcata does as it, as it uh, has been for years. Yeah. Uh, so we've been joined in the studio this week by Joanne Shook. She's co-producer of the film Tricky Business. It's showing this week. Well, not this week if you're watching. It's showing the week of January 17th and 18th at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Nevada City. However, it'll be at other festivals, and you can go to trickybusiness.com to, um, to uh, find out more information. And it will be on your oh, and public access We'll channel. be airing it on DCTV Channel 15 as well, thanks to Joanne, who brought us a copy today. So you can look at our schedule online at davismedia.org if you'd like to find out when. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Thank you. You're welcome, and tune in next week for another topic on In the Studio.